Okay, you're live and recording now. I guess we're on, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> All right, therefore, uh, good morning to everybody. Good morning to our guests and good morning to the audience uh, following us. Uh, this is a, a very important opportunity for all of us uh, to reflect and have a chance to discuss uh, the issues that are unfortunately ailing the American democracy. Um, uh, with us, uh, we have distinguished guests who really know a great deal about America, politics, uh, political parties, and the you know and the underlying currents uh, that, um, unfortunately, in the last few years have uh, conspired to make uh, our political, uh, how can I say, landscape, to put it mildly more complicated. Okay, I'll leave it to the experts to express uh, their opinions. My name is Paolo von Schirach, um, and I'm uh, happy to be here serving as moderator. Um, my functions are uh, as to be president of the Global Policy Institute, the think tank located in downtown Washington, D.C. And again, since we're talking about American government, we're right two blocks away from the White House, for whatever is worth. And also, I serve as chair of political science and international relations at Bay Atlantic University. Excuse me. Excuse me. This is one of our panelists calling. Hey, Jay, Jay. Yeah. No, no, we're we're on, but I, we don't see you. I have no idea how to do this. Uh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we, we have a panelist here who's trying to join us. I have really no idea how to do this, to be honest with you. <laughs> can you? We can save the world, but we don't know how to connect on video. <laughs> I have no idea, but we're on here now, so I, I can't, I, I really don't know how to assist you. I'm sorry. Try again. Now. Okay. Sorry. Okay, let's do that. All right, so we have uh, one of our panelists who having, who's having technical issues in uh, joining us up. He's on the phone. <laughs> it's not the perfect setting, but he's trying to figure out the technicalities uh, of, uh, getting, of getting into, the, into this panel. And for the time being, he's on the phone and listening to us um, you know, uh, via speakerphone. That's the best we can do. Um, as I said to him, I, my technical expertise is extremely limited and therefore not able to assist him in figure, figuring out a way to uh, join the panel. So, as I was saying, uh, we, we are going through, you know, as the Chinese would say, interesting times, right, uh, uh, in America, in, in American politics. And um, we've been through, how can, how can I say, unprecedented um, developments in the last several years. Uh, from obviously the, the appearance into the national scene of Donald Trump, uh, a man of, uh, you know, whatever you may think of him, but certainly who had no uh, political past or experience, but was catapulted from nothing into the White House. Uh, and he won the, the, the elections. It was a very um, controversial. There were it's obviously efforts by many, one would, could argue, if you're one of his followers, uh, to say the efforts to discredit him. There was the whole story of the Russia collusion, you know, attempt to say that he was essentially a Russian agent or paid for or, or whatever that he, or that the Russians had something on him, et cetera, et cetera. And that's part of, of the, you know, of the period from 2016 to 2020. Then we had the elections that everybody knows about. And again, the same man, Donald Trump, um, who tried to undermine uh, the elections uh, actively, you know, through a, a variety of, uh, but I'll let the experts discuss this, basically a, a, a variety of, well, I would say gimmicks, but it's more than gimmicks. Uh, there seems to be, you know, real efforts at um, basically, um, how can I say, subverting 
the uh, proper electoral process uh, through, I don't know, subterfuge and different ideas of trying to invalidate a national election. And this unfortunately culminated with the attack on the US Parliament, uh, the, the Congress uh, on January 6th of 2021. None of this happened uh, in, you know, in our history. The last time the Parliament, the Congress was attacked was by a, a British invasion force, uh, you know, in the War of 1812. Uh, that was an act of war. It wasn't a civil disturbance. It wasn't an insurrection or anything like that. So there we are. The country is divided. Um, uh, many uh, Republicans to this day continue to believe that Donald Trump actually won the elections fair and square and that he was cheated. The election was stolen. On the other hand, if we look at the Democratic Party, and I'll stop here, we see that the party has veered dramatically to the left. Uh, the progressive, the progressive. Uh, how can I say? Oh, there we go. We're here. We see you. Oh, good. Okay. Okay, we're good. So I'm gonna gonna turn the phone off, otherwise you have a mess here. Uh, there was a function on there that says I'm ready on one of the screens, and you had to kind of minimize that so I could see the to click. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. uh, anyway, we're good. So we yeah, just good. go through the uh, the openings here, and uh, we, we're happy to to see you, JD. And good so, so there we are. I, I was just saying, as we have seen this uh, uh, dichotomy in U.S. politics, we also see the Democratic Party having veered to the left dramatically, and we've seen the election of Joe Biden. This is, I think, his third try, uh, you know, to for the White House. And, uh, you know, and right now, again, we can go more into details. Um, he doesn't seem to doing well. Uh, the, his uh, favorables are extremely low. Uh, it doesn't look like his uh, uh, policy plan to spend um, an inordinate amount of money on um, issues which seem to be very dear to the left of his party it doesn't seem to wash very well with the rest of the country and certainly with at least a some critical elements of his own party, notably a couple of senators who say no, no, no to Democrats, who say no, no, no to everything, and essentially blocked uh, critical legislation uh, in, in, in the Congress. So we are in very, con very confused and confusing times where the only thing, my own takeaway, but I would like to hear from the experts here, is uh, that the country has probably never been so divided in recent memory. I am an immigrant, <laughs> but I, I came to the United States in 1978, and I do not recall uh, experiencing a, a period of uh, such uh, um, intense animosity between the, the two political parties uh, uh, and the various uh, you know, groups aligned or closely or loosely with them. So where are we? Is, is American democracy in peril? Is there a way out of this? Uh, the floor is open. Can I start with you, Madam Ashley? You want to say something about this? <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty to say. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I think it American democracy is in jeopardy. And part of that is for all the many reasons you've just enumerated. There is um, a great polarization among the electorate that has happened. Um, there are a lot of changes, particularly at the state level, that are making it um, more challenging to um, participate in the elections. And I think one of the things that we focus on, particularly, um, I'm a civic engagement consultant, is how do you really ensure that the most people in the country can participate in our elections in order, you know, that's that's the number one sign of a healthy democracy is robust uh, civic participation across your population. And even in 2020, when we had historic voter participation rates, it was still just two thirds of the country that that showed up and only half of um, people under the age of 30 that participated. And that is, I think, um, you know, really challenging. And there's a number of um, reasons for that, both disillusionment with elected officials and government and institutions in general. Um, but there are also some structural barriers to participation that probably need to be addressed in order to make things a little bit easier for folks to come out. So I think that we're in a really 
interesting and challenging moment as a country and as a world. We've lived through a global pandemic. Um, we are facing, you know, down a, a very challenging situation in Europe right now. There's there's a lot of challenges in general, and um, I am optimistic that people are are paying more attention than ever before, and that we have an opportunity to salvage things here. Um, but it's it's certainly an issue that everyone needs to be monitoring really closely and, and actively participating in. Thank you for that. Alan, what, what's your take? And let me ask a specific question. Do you think that the two political parties have become so polarized uh, in terms of uh, their um, having embraced, or it seems uh, the more extreme positions, so the, the far left in the Democratic Party, and uh, what many have described, I think appropriately, the Republican Party having turned into essentially a, a Trump cult party. Not entirely, but it seems uh, that he still, you know, commands a, an enormous uh, degree of influence, and he continues to sell the message that he's, uh, you know, that he's essentially the president of the United States uh, in exile somehow because he won the election fair and square, as he says many times, by a lot, right? Uh, and that's uh, where we are. What's your take? Thank you. <clears throat> I will get to your specific question, but I'd like to broaden it out a little bit and talk a, a little bit about, as I indicated when I joined this session, about my book, 13 Cracks, Repairing American Democracy After Trump. And I begin the book by saying, look, democracy is precious. But like all precious things, it can be destroyed. We saw the golden age of democracy after World War I, when we had some two dozen democracies out of almost nothing. And then by the mid-1940s, democracies had been cut in half. There were only about 10 or 11 democracies left, and they were hanging by a thread. What's the lesson? Democracy can be destroyed in two ways. It can be destroyed by external invasion, like we saw when the Nazis invaded Western Europe, and like we're seeing today in an extraordinary, horrific deja vu, the Russians attempting to destroy democracy in Ukraine through invasion. But, and this gets to your question, democracy can also be imploded from within. And that's what we're seeing in the United States today. The respected economist that keeps track of democracies during the era of Donald Trump has downgraded American democracy to a flawed democracy. We were once a beacon to the world. Now we're number <clears throat> 25. 25 in democracies around the world. That's just shocking. And as you point out, Throughout the Trump years, he has blasted through what I call the 13 cracks, the loopholes in our democracy that need to be closed. And we saw that culminating in the violence and insurrection of January 6th. But, and to get to your question about the Republican Party, January 6th was not a unique sui generis event. It was rather part of what had build, been building up for a very long time within the Republican Party. It looks like everything okay there? People are, commenting. People are making comments or question, uh, sending in questions. Ah. I believe, Alan, you are back, but you froze for a little bit. Oops. Looks like his camera froze. Then it was live again. Well, as we wait for him to come back, J.D., uh, please give us your take. On, First, on thanks. Thanks, Paolo. First of all, welcome. 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 Welc
Thanks to Frank York and Richter for the kind invitation to join you all today. Uh, well, structurally, I think we've had two major problems for the past two elections in our democracy. In 2016, we had essentially the administrative state put itself above the candidates and put itself above American democracy. Uh, specifically, we had talked about this in the pre-call, uh, Paolo, that uh, the FBI James Comey, FBI Director James Comey at the time, uh, intervened three times during the 2016 election. Uh, first, he intervened uh, on behalf of Hillary Clinton by deciding not to charge her over her emails from when she was Secretary of State. Um, however, she had been uh, 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 the Secretary of State years before that. So if the FBI was going to charge her, they should have done it way before she was the Democratic nominee or not at all. So he intervened once on behalf of Hillary Clinton. Then he intervened twice on behalf of Donald Trump. First, he had that press conference in uh, the summer of 2016, uh, which if you don't charge someone, you don't have a press conference about not charging them. And he called her extremely careless. That was damaging to her. And then right before the election, at the end of October, he reopens the investigation into Hillary Clinton over the emails over uh, one of her aides, Huma Abedin, uh, her husband, uh, Anthony Weiner, got caught up in, in a... In a um, a sex case. And uh, that was very damaging to Hillary Clinton. And so you had three times the director of the FBI weighing in above the American people and above our democracy. And so that was the first one, the the administrative state putting itself above democracy and above the, the political parties, essentially. And, and it, he, I believe he influenced the outcome of the election, which helped Donald Trump. Then the pendulum swung where he was trying to hurt Donald Trump after that through the uh, Russiagate collusion hoax, which was a hoax. There was no collusion with Russia, but it paralyzed the country for um, several years. Uh, there were unending investigations, it, it seemed, <laughs> against President Trump and, and his associates who did nothing wrong, completely innocent. Yet uh, they were framed as guilty in the media anyway, and it, and it was destabilizing for the country for two years. Then COVID hit. And... <laughs> Our elections changed. Uh, they went from election day to election season, and there were a number of irregularities. However, since the election was so close, only 44,000 votes in a few states, uh, President Trump refused to say that he lost the election, even though uh, there's evidence that there, there was not enough irregularities to make a difference anyway. So uh, that culminated in multiple rallies that were called Stop the Steal, which culminated in the Capitol riot of January 6th. So when you combine what happened in 2016 with 2020, these are very anti-democratic things that happened structurally in the country. So to fix those, first of all, the Congress has to have better oversight over the administrative state, over the government, which they have oversight or they control. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, as far as elections go, we have to make sure that, that our 50 states um, uh, uh, free and fair elections, and that the, the standards we had in the past, as far as uh, no ballot harvesting and um, no mass mail-in voting, those things change. So election day is election day and not election season, because that will give future people who lose an election the, 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 the idea and the, the reason to say that well, we didn't lose because there were there was a months months long election. And so that that if someone else loses in a very close election, like President Trump did, they won't be able to say that they actually didn't lose. So Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump uh, didn't do the country any favors in their reactions to the 2016 election and the 2020 election. So we have to struck fix those structural reforms in order to save our democracy. Yeah. Thank you for that. Just for clarity, I, I should say, I mean, I understand what you're saying about uh, the efforts uh, to frame uh, uh, Donald Trump and to kind of make up, you know, the famous, uh, you know, dossier, you know, the steel dossier, which was garbage, essentially, which was sold as concrete, uh, you know, smoking gun evidence, etc. However, in fairness to Hillary Clinton, a few hours after the 26th election, she conceded to Donald Trump. Absolutely. And that's, that's false equivalencies. That's false a, equivalencies of poisoning our democracy. And President like Barack Obama, uh, the outgoing president, congratulated Donald Trump on his election. He wasn't too happy to do that, certainly, but he did that hours 
after the you know the media announced the winner. So there, you know, it, there's a huge difference. Donald Trump, to my again, the experts may correct me. I don't know of any other losing presidential candidate who refused to concede. I don't know of anyone. Uh, you know, in in never in my. My well, inspired yeah. an insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. Did you lose right. me in the middle of my talk? Please. Yeah, you were frozen, I, but, but just finish, finish that talk? point before we end there. Hillary Clinton said she was going to join the resistance, and she said the election was not legitimate, and she said she joined the resistance, which undermined President Trump to do elect the president continuously for several Piles years. Piles of nonsense. Oh. There's yeah. not anything close to what Donald Trump did to what Hillary Clinton did. As... Uh, Powell pointed out she immediately conceded. Donald Trump has not conceded to this day. A year and four months after the election, he is still lying about the election. In fact, it is the big lie. And the January 6th committee just two days ago came out with compelling evidence that this is part of what they believe to be a deep criminal conspiracy to undermine our democracy, marked by things like electoral fraud, uh, putting out fraudulent electoral slates in the states, claiming that Donald Trump should get the electoral votes of the states. How can you compare anything Hillary Clinton did, agitating the country to believe that the election was stolen from him, when his own attorney general, his own FBI director, his own head of cybersecurity, his own head of the Election Assistance Commission, all said this was the most safe, secure, and fair election that we've ever had in the history of the country. And then this culminated in that rally on January 6th and this unprecedented assault on the Capitol that resulted in five to seven deaths and over 100 police officers being injured. This wasn't ordinary tourists. This wasn't police and rioters kissing one another. And as I was trying to point out in my talk, this didn't come out of nowhere. This has been a concerted part of the Republican Party now for several years, culminating in Donald Trump to try to diminish our democracy. There's a wonderful new study by Professor Asif Grumbach, who looks at the states, looks at every state, and he calls it laboratories of democratic backsliding. And he shows how the states are now restricting and undermining democracy. And that the sole factor when you control for everything else is con Republican control of the states that are doing things like draconian purging of voter rolls, uh, restricting the ability of people to vote uh, absentee cutting back on early voting, cutting back on other options that allow people to vote. It's, the problem is not irregularities. That's not an issue. The issue is what the states are doing to restrict voting. In my book, 13 Cracks, one of the most important things I point out to try to save our democracy is to pass national laws restricting political gerrymandering where the line drawers decide elections, not the voters, and to stop all of these restrictive election practices. I also point out it is absolutely critical to have a new election count law, the law we have now that Donald Trump and his followers tried to exploit and destroy our democracy dates to 1887. It needs to be rewritten. We need new rules and regulation for openness and transparency in government. You know, one of the another hallmark of the Donald Trump years that's continued with the January 6th investigation is the stonewalling of Congress, the stonewalling of public, the keeping of uh, government in secrecy and withholding critical information like Donald Trump's tax returns, his visitor logs uh, from the American people. I outlined 13 critical reforms that I think can save our democracy. But ultimately, as James Madison, the father of our Constitution, pointed out, you can have all the laws, all the rules, all the constitutions you want. But if we don't have civic virtue, if we have people like Donald Trump with 40% or more support from the American people blatantly lying about 
our democracy, trying to undermine our democracy, spurring on violence, then all the rules and all the laws aren't going to change. Maybe, maybe this Ukraine crisis has somewhat brought Americans together and reminded us of the precious values that we do share. And perhaps we'll see a resurgence of civic virtue in America. As Abraham Lincoln once said, the best way to predict your future is to choose it. Yeah. Ashley, let me ask you the point that Alan was just making about this uh, really old uh, law that, uh, you know, there was a with the effort on the part of uh, Trump and his lawyers to manipulate it in order to demonstrate that somehow it was possible to invalidate the, you know, the electoral votes of some states and that there was an opening there because to say, well, it's enough to say that those are, are invalid and that the Congress would welcome a different slate of uh, electors, right? And that would poof magically, you know, change everything. And Mike Pence would say, yeah, yeah, I pick this, not those. And miraculously, Trump gets uh, to stay in the White House. That law is a uh, murky in some fashion. The language is unclear. The circumstances that prompted its passing are long, long gone. There seems to be some movement, bipartisan movement, from what I've read, uh, you know, to change, the, to amend that and to make it clear so that it is absolutely clear that the states elect the president and the Congress simply takes notice. And there's a, it's a ceremonial you know, protocol act and that the vice president has no power to invalidate anything. He simply is there, he or she, in the case of Kamala Harris, you know, um, is there to read the results and accept them as presented by the states. Do you think that this is something, talking about some elements of uh, bipartisan virtue and sanity, I would say, that there is a good chance that this will be done, that this uh, amendment to the old law will actually uh, be uh, agreed upon and that uh, on a bipartisan basis that this is possible? I think it's certainly possible. And I, I mean, part of the reason to think that is that it was it was possible to get the actual verified election results approved by a bipartisan Congress in January, which led to the inauguration of President Biden. And, um, you know, you had constitutional scholars advising the vice president to act in a way that he followed through with, which I think is, you know, a sign of, um, to Alan's point, we, we have a lot of cracks in our democracy right now, but it withstood the the pressure. And there were people um, on on both sides of the political spectrum, on, on the wide uh, lay of the political spectrum that stood up to protect democracy in 2020. And I think some of these reforms that folks are considering are, you know, how can we prevent a similar issue in, in the future? But I do think that the precedent that was set to say, you know, this actually isn't how we do things. And you can't, um, like, truly, you just can't be a sore loser. Because um, it's not, you both never happened before in history. And um, it's just not the way to govern is really important. And I do think, you know, um, one thing that uh, JD said that I think is, is actually really important to, to uplift is, um, Hillary Clinton did say that she would join the quote unquote resistance. That That is a sign of a healthy democracy, having really healthy competition and having parties that are in opposition to each other and have different policy perspectives and are fighting um, to be elected. That is what our democracy is. We have multiple party system and people um, competing for the voters uh voters support to actually become elected and speak on our behalf. I think one thing that's often missed, and I know there are a lot of folks here that are not from the United States, but I think what's often missed about our, our democracy is that these are, these are not, we're not out here fulfilling everyone's lifelong ambitions to be an elected official. We are choosing people who as part of our self-governance will represent our points of view and what and our sort of dreams and act in our best interest. And I think that's one of the things that was so inspiring about the 2020 election. You had the a historic number of people saying, I understand what is necessary and I will show up. And, you know, to JD's point, it was a close election. There's nothing wrong with it being a close election. That is what a healthy democracy is. Um, there is something deeply wrong with 
objecting to the results because you are unhappy with them and invalidating them and perpetuating um, lies. And I think it's really unhelpful. There's a question in the chat here about social media. I think one of the things that's un most unhelpful in this moment is we have all these different platforms where people can come and say things that just simply aren't true and aren't backed from data and perpetuate even further. I mean, one of the things that JD said that I would just point out is, is just actually wrong is, you know, some of these um, lengthening of the election, it was literally not possible to administer the election in 2020 without an elongated time period. You simply did not have the staff, the resources to keep polling places available. You still don't. You had in Texas, they had to close several polling places this year, just, uh, just this week for the primary election because there's just staffing shortages because of the global pandemic that we're going through. And so you have, um, you have now much data showing that actually having these kinds of systems that allow people to participate in more convenient ways that allow people who would otherwise be working during business hours on a random Tuesday, which by the way, was chosen for the agriculture calendar that we had back in the um, 1700s and, you know, no longer drives our economy. Um, it is really important that those kinds of reforms stay in place so that people can participate. Because again, the number one indicator of a healthy democracy is the number of people that are allowed to, per to participate in it. And I think this is actually not a partisan issue. You have Democrats and Republicans who have benefited greatly from these policies in states like Oregon, which has had mail voting and elongated elections for a long time in Colorado. And you just have never seen those folks complain before about the results of the election. Well, J.D., I'm sure you want to say something about it. Uh, but uh, my own personal comment is that uh, uh, a, a prolonged voting uh, season, if you wish, it's nothing new. But, uh, many states have early voting. Some have extended early voting. Some may be more constrained. But this is not something that was invented in 2020, to my knowledge. But you, it was not. It, it's right. Been, but the, okay. the issue, just to respond briefly. Please, the, go the ahead. Issue, right. The issue is... A lot of states changed the uh, verification for signatures on ballots, for instance. The Wisconsin Special Counsel just this week came out with a report saying that there were a lot of election irregularities in Wisconsin where you had 100 percent voting in nursing homes, where you had illegal drop boxes for people to put their ballots in, things of that nature. Now, I'm not saying that that was going to change the results of the national election. We don't have evidence of that at all. However, there were a lot of irregularities and there was a lot of frustration throughout the United States because of the attacks on President Trump and his family and his associates and his administration uh, transition and campaign. There was a lot of bitterness from Republicans and that bitterness led to the dysfunction of 2020, which culminated in the Capitol riot, which everyone can agree was horrific for the United States and made the country look like a uh, worse than the developing world. I think everybody can agree on that. And I do agree with uh, Alan's point about the gerrymandering. The last time I checked for the state of New York, the Democrats were trying to make the count 22 Democrats to just four Republicans. And that is not how the state of New York hey, It's is not just the Democrats. Manage. Look at North Carolina. No, I, I, I know, I know, I, I know. Why, I'm, not you arguing with only that. The Democrats? I'm, I'm not arguing with you about that. But if you're talking about gerrymandering, well, we talk about Democrats and Republicans, and the most extreme example I saw was the, the New York count, 22 to 4. Tennessee had a, a count that went the other way for Republicans, but it wasn't as dramatic. So, yes, I agree about gerrymandering. That is a structural issue that must be addressed. You in couldn't be more wrong democracy. about that. For Every both Democrats and Republicans. Been vastly more Can you let me talk, Alan? But why do you always interrupt? Please. Why do you always interrupt? Because you're, 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 you're perpetrating lies. No, 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 I'm not. not. Please, please. I'm not. Let, you, let the JD you, finish, please. You, you, you're it might be worth noting that... that those may be the small lies. Why don't you let the, 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 the moderator the run the panel? Please, instead please. Of constantly let, let JD, let, please, Alan, let, let JD complete his thoughts. Yeah, I was just saying that it's Democrats and Republicans, uh, and I agree with Alan's point. I was trying to agree with him that gerrymandering is a real problem and it's not just democrats it's republicans too and the most extreme example i saw was from new york 22 to 4 democrats republican and republicans and that's not the percentage of democrat and republican voters in new york and the state of new york at all 
So with that, I'd like to yield it back to Paolo. Maybe we have some right. questions well, look, in the last 10 minutes from some so people in the, in the audience. Before, because again, we're talking also with many people who may not be familiar with the technicalities and the complexities. I mean, arguably, our constitution is very complicated and our system is very complicated. Many people don't quite understand, for instance, just to say a malady, that for us is kind of a non-issue. How come that the president, that the candidate that gets the most votes and, you know, nationally is not president automatically? How can it be that you, as in the case of Hillary Clinton in 2016, you win the popular vote, but you lose the elections? How is that possible? Well, because, yeah. you know, we've got our own system, you know, with the, because the states. I can comment on that as a story. But that, you know, some people say, what? How is that possible? How is that democratic? Isn't, isn't the voice of the people what really matters? How come that, again, Donald Trump, if I'm not mistaken, in 2016, won in the Electoral College by a margin of 77,000 votes. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's my best of my recollection. And right. he lost the popular vote by two, 2 million people. And at that time, when that was uh, pointed out to him, he said, oh, but those were all illegal immigrants who voted. And that was that. Was that. that was his response. He said, those, no, those votes don't count because they were all illegal, illegal immigrants in California that voted. If we go down to this level, this is a way of undermining our system because that diminishes confidence on the part of the general public as to the uh, you know fairness and effectiveness of the system so we have the system we've got we inherited from our founding fathers it's very complicated because america is a federal republic etc cetera, etc cetera, the role of the states and whatnot but before without getting bogged down into all these technicalities I'm really trying to, to get to is whether all of you, because also I think we're getting to the end of our time here, do you think that this extreme polarization of, you know, that we are experiencing now, is this just a passing phenomenon? Just, you know, something comes, something goes, you know, and, and there we go and, and things then settle down. I mean, my very simple common sense observation, nonpartisan, I hope <laughs> that it will be, is that the country is run by the middle. Ronald Reagan, you know, who came in, in, as president in 1980 and who was considered this kind of diabolical, strange character, you know, California curiosity, weird guy who was going to upset the whole country, in the end tried, and some may disagree with his, the outcome of his presidency, but at least there were real efforts with some successes at creating bipartisan coalitions. And a certain degree still of uh, notwithstanding the political divisions between Democrats and Republicans, but to create a certain degree of committee and ability to, to, to discuss issues and, and come to some kind of you know, compromise between Democrats and Republicans in Congress that, that managed to get certain things done. Now, whether these are good things, bad things, I don't know. It's a, it's a question of judgment. But at least there was a certain process which seem to encourage or at least to permit bipartisanship. Now, Democrats and Republicans don't even walk on the same side of the street, let alone talk to each other. This is where we are right now. I mean, we are at a, at a degree of polarization, which is, to, in my memory, uh, unprecedented. And so we have now, you know, the, the Republican Party, which unfortunately uh, you know, continues the rank and file voters to believe that Donald Trump won the elections, which is preposterous to say the least. And Donald Trump continues to milk the system by, by fundraising like crazy on the basis of, of this outright lie. On the other hand, the, Republic, the Democratic Party, the way I see it, has gone way over the deep end on, on, you know, in, on progressive policy issues. And again, I, I am not against it, many of the, the programs or issues that are being advocated, but uh, I do not see, you know, how uh, those how can I say, those uh, preferences, those priorities mesh with middle America. I mean, this seems to be they're gone way far to the left. And the agenda that Mr. Biden presented to Congress in his first year in office uh, clearly doesn't seem to be in line with the feelings of the majority of the electorate. That's my own take. I'm not basing this on any scientific information, polling or what have you. But that's my sense of after 40 plus years here in Washington. 
of where we are. And so if the Democratic Party continues to be you know, way far to the left and the Republican Party continues to be a you know, prisoner of, of, uh, of, uh, of Donald Trump, it's really hard to see how we move forward. Um, any, any suggestions from the enlightened experts here? Ashley, do you have any thoughts about how do we get back to a, some degree of centrism? It seems to me most of the moderates, both Republicans and Democrats, have simply bailed out. They're not running for election. They go away. They say, we say I'm done. I'm not, I'm not playing this thing. It's, not, it's worthless. What, what, do you see this turning around? Well, I think I'm asking Ashley, then, then you, Alan, and, and then JD, and then I think we're done. I yeah. think there's a nuance to be made here that, um, first of all, the polarization and the, the, the pull to the far right, far left is mostly um, driven by a media narrative. That is what the prevalent media narrative is. If you look at the, as, at least on the Democrat, who is elected at the presidential level, incredible moderate. Like if you ask the, the the far left who they wanted to be president in 2020, Joe Biden would not rank on the top 20, right? Um, if you look at all of the U.S. senators running for re-election in any of the, the contested states, they are they they are the more moderate folks like that. The gubernatorial candidates that are running also the more moderate centrist folks. And then you get to the House, which is the people's house. There's a lot of diversity of opinion in there. Depends on what district you're in. Speaking of redistricting, how safe are you? How likely to be primary are you? And there's just a broader range of, of um, voices there. And I think you are seeing some members of Congress who are retiring, who maybe are of the more moderate ilk on both sides. Um, but that is not necessarily indicative of what they feel feel is like a takeover of the the party. And I would say, especially on the left, um, it's just not true. And I think if you have conversations with, if you look at the real map and you look at the actual candidates, it's actually a pretty small number of folks. And that's not to say that the activist organizations, again, on both sides, aren't very vocal and aren't very prominently out there advocating for their own policies. Um, but you don't, you don't see that. I think the, the main thing people point to as the progressive side is like, oh, there's people out there saying defund the police. Well, you saw the president and the State of the Union say fund the police. Like, what better representation of where the party's platform is at than to be countering some of those messaging? So I would just say, I think it's a false narrative and I think it's it's just not true. And I, I think um, it is, again, just to go back to, you have the majority of Americans who sit in this sort of center area who, if empowered to show up and emboldened to participate in our election, I think you will continue to see um, them voting for people who most align with what they they believe. Real quick, right, Alan, and then Jeff, JD. I'm yeah. offer, uh, uh, first, a moment of hope. You know, we've been as polarized as this before. We had a civil war, after all, and in the 1930s, we were equally polarized as we are today, as and we got through it. But I think you put your finger, sadly, on the wrong thing. It's not issue polarization that matters. We've had issue polarization throughout our history. It's the culture wars that's really causing this polarization. It's one thing to say my opponent is wrong on the issue. It's another thing to say my opponent is un-American. My opponent is immoral. My opponent is against religion. That is the kind of polarization that we've got to combat. We've got to stop the culture wars. As long as the culture wars are being perpetrated, we are never going to come together. All right. I okay. agree with those last two points from Ashley and from Jeez. Alan. I see Ashley's cat in the background. Yeah, yeah. It looks like a nice one. <laughs> Just jumped on the couch. I agree with the last two points from uh, Ashley and Alan. Very much so. Well, it looks like uh, we've been, uh, um, our, the time allocated to us, uh, ladies and gentlemen, has been uh, exhausted. I, of course, there's a lot more to talk about. I really appreciate your effort and particularly getting up early this morning <laughs> for, 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 for a very, uh, you know, um, you know, brisk uh, uh, kind of post-dawn uh, conversation. I, I appreciate your contributions. And uh, I guess uh, at this point, we, 
we should uh, stand adjourned because uh, the uh, session within the Horaziz conference has uh, been terminated by powers beyond my control. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. And uh, well, maybe to be continued in another forum. I, my pleasure to have met all of you, JD, of course, you're an old friend here and uh, Alan and Ashley, good luck in Florida. Probably we'll see you in Washington, D.C. post COVID. And uh, we stand adjourned. You know where to find me. Take Thank care. Thank you, guys. Bye, Paolo. Thank you. Bye, Bye everybody.